what I, what I was really thinking about talking about today just for literally a couple of minutes was um, stereo, uh, stereotypes. And I was thinking about, like, we have um, four, almost 400, somewhere in the neighborhood of 375 or so of you um, in this room and in some of these other rooms. And uh, th there's often these stereotypes about, you know, social workers and case workers and people who do casework not really being interested or, or can't handle numbers. We're not numbers people. But clearly, the, with the turnout here, that stereotype, I think, is crushed. People are interested in data and information. And the other stereotype that I think we, that this, this group is tugging against is the fact that you know public child welfare agencies, pub, uh, state level, county level, our probation colleagues, et cetera, really want to keep doing what we've been doing. We're comfortable in broken systems. We're, we're comfortable as bureaucrats doing what we've always done because it's safe and comfortable. And what I'm here to, what I, what I think I'm seeing here today is a bunch of people who aren't comfortable with the status quo, are people who are inquisitive, people who are interested in change, people who want to make smart, informed decisions by what the data is telling us through administrative data, what our consumers uh, and children and families are, are telling us through the qualitative uh, data that we get, um, how, how best to, and, and folks who really want to engage the communities in which um, they serve and support. And so I think a number of those, those uh, stereotypes that often get attributed to us um, as, you know, state or county workers or public employees or whatever, um, I think we're challenging those stereotypes today. I also think that, as Susan described, you know, kind of our little micro partnership, if you will, our friendship and co a collegial, collegial, whatever the actual word is, um, for over the years, we can't, as a field, do this work without really legitimate partnerships with, you know, academia, the courts, community-based organizations, indigenous leaders, the faith community, and others to really, because we're, they're, they're, the, the kids and families that we serve and that we care about live in communities that also care about them deeply and are surrounded by a number of local institutions that really want to make a difference in their lives too. The, 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 the data and information that comes to us through um, through various channels and the fact that we are able to come together for a few days and talk about that here, I think really will solidify those partnerships and it's only through those partnerships that will actually have the impact that those of you um, who got into this field I suspect want to have. So um, I I want to um, congratulate you for you know helping me break some stereotypes or joining me in breaking stereotypes. I want to challenge you and uh, throughout the rest of the day here uh, to ask questions, to ask why, to wonder if things could be done differently, to listen to people openly and and genuinely, and then to take that that the spirit of this work and the, and the information that you've gathered over the, the last couple of days back with you to wherever it is you practice uh, your craft and, ha and have these few, these few days live on in the work you do. So um, welcome uh, to day two. Um, we are, this is one of the big, uh, our biggest, uh, most popular events, so thank you for helping us make it popular and keeping it popular. With that, I really want to um, uh, get ready to turn the podium over. It's my pleasure. Um, I'm not sure how much of an introduction I need to do. If you just look up at the, at the slide here, you'll see that, uh, that Bryant Marks is uh, a Renaissance man. He's uh, a, a minister, a trainer, an academia, award-winning ex, ex, or an award-winning um, uh, educator. Mission has, in, in life has seemed to be really to provide um, uh, wisdom and, and be thoughtful about, uh, about, uh, about the work. His 
been in, um, involved in a number of really influential um, things at, uh, at the federal level, in, in, with including um, the Obama administration's uh, advisors um, on um, the initiative on educational excellence for African Americans. Um, he's been in, in the White House as a um, senior advisor, works uh, with and uh, historically black colleges, um, has done all kinds of work around implicit bias. Um, and I'm particularly interested in hearing today's uh, talk as I'm one of the, the, um, the uh, executive sponsors for our department and the uh, um, Government Alliance for Race and Equity. And so, um, uh, uh, Dr. Um, Marx is not only a, a scholar and and a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a Renaissance man. He, he's he's a husband and father, a community, a strong community member. And I, I for one, am ready to hear what he has to say right now. So would you do me a great pr uh, pleasure and in inviting Dr. Uh, Marx to the to the stage today? Right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning everyone. Good morning. All right. Good to see you all this morning. So my name is Bryant Marks. I'm a professor of psychology at Morehouse College in Atlanta. Uh, I'll talk more about that shortly. But I do want to give a couple quick shout outs. Uh, for those who have arranged uh, conferences and meetings before, you know there's a lot of moving parts. And so I thank the whole team that put this together. Uh, Susan, I don't know who she is. Uh, uh, okay, Susan, uh, Terry, Terry's always been, a, Terry Gillens, there you go, all right, LA County representing. So there's a lot of folks who made this happen. Uh, so I'm glad, glad, glad to be here. My UC Davis connection, real quick. Uh, oh, the cameras are rolling. Uh, okay. Um, so. Grad school for me was at the University of Michigan, uh, and my girlfriend at the time, she was a couple years older than me, she did a postdoc here at UC Davis. And uh, today she's one of the top researchers all, on Alzheimer's. But I would come out here to UC Davis you know, to visit her, so this campus has contributed to her career in a significant way, so that's my UC Davis connection. Uh, we're, we're not together, but it was, it was a mutual thing. It was cool, you know what I'm saying? Then my wife is watching, she's like, how are you gonna shout out to your ex? I love you too, baby, all right, okay. So. All right, all right, <laughs> all right, gotta keep the peace. Okay, so, but real quick, uh, this is why I do the work, right? So when you look here, this is me and my daughter. Um, she's 12 now, this is when she was two years old. So I do the work uh, for her and my family. I'm a father of three children, and um, uh, I'm on the road quite a bit. Uh, Terry, <laughs> we can tell you about this. I'm on the road uh, five to six days a week. I train up to four to six cities per week. So this is a six city week, okay? So this week is Phoenix, Seattle, New York, Atlanta, uh, Sacramento, and another one, all right? I am, <laughs> I, I, seriously, right. But I'm engaged in the work. So this is a season where I'm on leave from Morehouse to engage in this work at a deeper level. Um, there's a few departments that, I, that are sort of special for me that I go in a little deeper. This is one of them. So children and family services, absolutely. Probation, absolutely. So you got two of those, uh, touching on two of those. Uh, prosecutors and law enforcement. Why? I focus on uh, youth, primarily youth of color, uh, males of color uh, more deeply. And the way we look at this work is young people exist in an ecosystem of organizations and adults. So we deal directly with the young people, right? So I'm at Morehouse, predominantly black male college, so we deal directly with young people, but we also deal with the adults and institutions that surround them. Because as you know, yes, we, we, we are individuals, but we function within situations and environments. So my job, when I can, um, work with entities like uh, Children and Family Services, probation and so forth, you all are making uh, decisions that affect people's lives in a serious and very real way. Whether people keep, keep their kids or not, whether they get them back or not, how you set policy and practice, those are significant decisions. So with you all, I take a deeper dive, so we're gonna have sort of uh, uh, some time together this morning and then we'll have a breakout uh, afterwards. Uh, so I'm gonna give you sort of some highlights and sort of an overview of the work we do, uh, probation, Children and Family Services, uh, by talking about implicit bias at some higher levels, but then we'll take a deeper dive uh, in the second session. Okay, so getting back here, put our slideshow back up, here we go. All right, so the hidden biases of good people, implications for child welfare and probation professionals and the populations they serve. I am Reverend Dr. Brian Marks, so in addition to being a scientist and psychologist, I'm also a Baptist preacher, right? 
No, just relax. I mean, like, Ooh, relax, 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 right? <laughs> Not getting all religious on you, right? I'm just saying, I believe in the notion of call and response between the speaker and the audience, even the overflow, okay? So I'll ask you questions. I'll go like this, and that means I want you to answer out loud, all right? Uh, we'll have um, some time in the, in the breakout for more discussion, but today I'm going to try to keep it interactive given uh, the format that we have. So. Um, uh, Executive Director and Principal Trainer at the National Training Against Student Race and Equity, tenured professor of psychology at Morehouse College. Uh, just to give you a sense of some of the work going on, some of you have had implicit bias tra training in the past. Oh, good question. How many of you have had implicit bias training or unconscious bias training within the past year that lasted two hours or longer where the entire topic was implicit bias or unconscious bias. Not diversity training, but a little piece on implicit bias. At least a two hour session or longer last year on implicit bias. Okay, all right, interesting, only a few folks. Um, I encourage you all to consider uh, this work in a deeper way. Um, implicit or unconscious bias is not a fad. It is a universal human principle that has always been with us and always will be. Uh, most of the forward-thinking organizations across the country are engaged in this work already. Uh, L.A. County is taking a deep dive. Uh, Board of Supervisors for L.A. County has required that all L.A. County employees receive implicit bias and cultural competency training. There's 108,000 L.A. County employees. Every single one of them will be trained. Okay? We trained about 25 of the 37 departments already. But LA County is probably the most aggressive in this work nationally. I mean, we train all over the country. But LA County is the public sector, the private sector. There's 88 cities within LA County. Several of the cities are engaged in this work. All right? DCFS, got to give you a little shout out. DCFS is the only entity within LA County, the 37 departments, that has started an equity office as a result of this work. So they're going, to, they're going to fully staff an equity office to make sure this is not a one-off check-the-box training. They're going to implement practices and policies over time that has some teeth and has some data and some accountability built in. Okay? So if you want to sort of find out what's going on best practices, I'm not trying to overload Terry, but make sure you talk to her and some of her colleagues in L.A. County. We also work with New York City. So New York City Public Schools has required that all New York City Public Schools personnel receive implicit bias training. There's 140,000 New York City Public Schools personnel. Every single one of them is in the process of being trained. Okay? So you're not being punished, you know, some because some of y'all might have been sort of voluntold to come here. <laughs> some of y'all volunteered, that's great, that's wonderful. Uh, but when it comes to a lot of the training we do across the country, it's mandatory training. And so when folks come in, they have sort of mixed perceptions of what they're gonna hear. Also, I'll just be honest and candid, <laughs> I don't know any other way to be. Um, Two of my toughest audiences, because I train a, 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 a lot of different uh, uh, constituencies and different groups, two of my toughest audiences across the country, cops and social workers. <laughs> cops and social workers. Cops, because police officers, they're trained to be skeptical, to be suspicious. Some would say many of them are even cynical. Eh, I don't know about that. Maybe. But the notion is they question everything. Oh, that's not true. That's not true. What about this? What about that? They're trained to be suspicious. So what I do with police officers, I just beat them about, about the head with all types of research and evidence and science. And then eventually they're like, okay, I get it. Maybe this is real. Okay? So social workers are tough. You know why social workers are tough? Because you all think you already got it right. Oh, I can't be biased. I'm on the front lines doing this work. I can't be biased. I'm working 60 hours a week and I'm writing checks out my pocket. I can't be biased. I hear you. That's wonderful. That's why you are hard to reach. Because you think, and you know what happens? A lot of people come up uh, during the breaks and when I do full day trainings, they say, oh yeah, Dr. Marsh, this is good. They need to hear this. They need to hear this. They. It's always they need to hear it. Never I need to hear it. They, they, they. Folks, I know I may be preaching to the choir to some extent, right? But you all believe in being lifelong learners, correct? All right, so there's always something new to potentially pick up. There's always uh, something that can enhance the good work you're already doing. All right, so here's the deal. Let's dig in. So I need everybody looking at the screen. Uh, this is going to happen a few times throughout our time together. Even folks in overflow, make sure that you can see the screen, looking up at the screen. I'm going to flash an image on the screen. It's going to be really, really quick. And then afterwards, I want you to tell me what you saw. Okay, so everybody looking at the screen, it's gonna be really, really quick. Everybody looking, here we go, here we go, real quick, here we go, real quick, here we go, real quick, here we go. Ooh, that was too quick, you didn't see it. Okay, let's try it again. All right, hold on real quick, here we go. All right, what'd you see? Face, half a face, okay. How many of y'all saw a face looking straight ahead, looking straight at you, all right? How many of y'all saw a face looking to the side, a profile shot, all right? Look again. I love the audible, oh, wow, oh, it's great. It's wonderful, right? Do you see both possibilities now? 
Here's the deal, folks. Two people can look at the same person or the same situation and see something completely different. As a matter of fact, one person can look at another person or a situation, have an initial impression, and then have what we call an aha moment, right? Aha, I see the other possibility, right? But your aha moment was a few seconds. In certain cases, it may be a few hours, days, weeks, months, or even years. It's all a matter of perspective. So a lot of what we're going to talk about today and in the breakout is perspective taking, not only from the perspective of uh, uh, children and family services, probation personnel, but also the public that you serve, elected officials, and a variety of other folks that have a stake in this thing that we call implicit or unconscious bias. Okay? So we have a few of these optical illusions. Um, I think they're pretty cool, but they also uh, make the point about implicit bias in, I think, a pretty compelling way. So our questions for the day. And this is going to be sort of broken up in part one and part two, so almost consider this somewhat of a commercial for the breakout. But I'm going to talk today about what is implicit bias. And really, after our time together, if you can't already describe implicit bias in your own words, you will be able to do so. Uh, what does implicit, implicit bias look like in the real world? So we're going to talk about some real world examples, some research, as well as how it applies to you. So that's going to be the bulk of what I talk about this morning. Uh, in the breakouts this afternoon, uh, we'll talk about the causes of implicit bias. We talk about how it's measured. We talk about how implicit bias affects the person holding the bias. So even as a holder of certain biases, it can affect you in a variety of ways. Uh, then we'll talk about how does implicit bias affect the target, the person on the receiving end. And finally, how can implicit bias be reduced or managed? So this morning, and, and, uh, and what's my hard stop? What's my hard stop time this morning? Um, my hard stop, I think. Fifteen, 9.20, okay, good deal. All right. Uh, for those who know me, uh, me, Tom, and I, we have an interesting relationship. Uh, <laughs> but, I'm, but 9.20, all right, good deal. So this, this, will, be, this will work. Okay, but this is where we're going. So uh, in the spirit of interaction, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to show you two options on the screen. I'm going to show you the two options. I'm going to say the two options. And then afterwards, I want you to yell out loud, literally yell out loud with some passion and vigor, who or what is better. Okay? So I'm going to show you the two options. I'm going to say the two options. I'm going to go like this, and you yell out loud who or what is better. All right? Can you do that for me? Yes. Can you do that for me? Yes. All right, here we go. And there's no right or wrong answers. So even if you don't like either option, still yell one of the two of them out. Okay? Even if you don't recognize either option, still yell one of the two of them out. This is a participation exercise. All right? And these are easy, 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 by the way. All right, first up, here we go. Who's better? Here we go. Beatles and the Rolling Stones. Yeah. Uh, I, sir, I'm not hearing the passion. What'd you say, sir? Yeah, you. What'd you say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pal, I need to hear the passion, though. That, this participation. Because if you can see, and you can hear, and you have a voice, and you choose not to participate, you are officially being what? Non-compliant. <laughs> yeah, y'all know about being compliant, right? Yeah, I need y'all to comply. All right. Easy, easy. Next up. Here we go. Who's better? Here we go. Who's better? Beyonce or Alicia Keys? All right, Beyonce Keys, all right, all right. All right, next up, who's better? Here we go, who's better? Michael Jackson or Prince? Prince. Yeah, see, some of y'all conflicted now, that Michael Jackson thing. Uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh, yo, ugh. Okay, I got you. All right, documentaries, ugh. Okay, let's move. All right, next up, who's better? Here we go, who's better? Mark Anthony or Romeo Santos? All right, some of y'all like, ugh. These are Latin recording artists, right? Some of the top selling of all time, like in the history of music, okay? All right, now this one should be interesting because I know we're from all over the state uh, here today. So for this next one, uh, who is better? But I do not want you to reflect on your childhood memories or days of glory in the past. The question is, who is better, all right? So if you had to bet your house, your spouse, your car, your kids, or your next check on the answer, that's how you answer. Who is better? Next up, here we go. Who's better? Here we go. Lakers, Warriors, or Kings? All right. Now, some, some of y'all are saying Lakers. Really? So you would take the Lakers in a seven-game series against the Warriors today and bet your house your spouse, your car, your kids, or your next check, uh-huh. Yeah, some of y'all like, take my kids, I need a break, take my kids. Okay, all right. All right, for this, <laughs> for this next one, what would you rather have? If you could only have one or the other, what would you rather have for this next one? Now, assume one does not come with the other. You'll see what I mean. What would you rather have? Next up, here we go, what would you rather have? Here we go. A raise or a promotion? 
Some of y'all real quiet. Is that all? That's a, okay. I'm, you got nice money and you got good status. Okay. And finally, finally, what is more important in your life right now in terms of priorities for this next one? What's more important? Next up, here we go. What's more important? Here we go. Your health or your wealth? Now, many of you all are saying health, and that's good, and I get that. Now, for many of us in the U.S., what the research shows is that we'll spend the first two-thirds, the three-quarters of our lives, sacrificing our health in the pursuit of wealth, right? Work, working 68-hour weeks, trying to accumulate and all this other stuff. And then, for many of us, we'll spend the last third to last quarter of our lives sacrificing our wealth, trying to get our health back, right? Isn't that Interesting. People getting older now, and you buy these workout programs, these Peloton machines, you know, I'm going to get my six-pack back. Yeah, I don't know about all that, right? But do the best you can. I'm in my middle years now, so I'm feeling this in a very real way. But folks, um, why do I show you all these? These are all priorities, explicit conscious preferences or priorities, whether it's sports teams, whether it's uh, um, health or wealth, whatever the case may be, we all have concrete explicit preferences at a conscious level. Implicit bias, to a significant extent, is sort of a first cousin to these explicit types of preferences, but they play out in sort of a unique way. And that's what we're going to talk about now. So I'm going to describe a scenario for you. The scenario is called the accident, the accident. Now, some of you may have heard this scenario before. So if, as I'm describing the scenario, you realize, oh, I've heard this before, do not respond to the question that I ask at the end. If you realize you've heard this before, just remain silent and do not whisper anything to your neighbor. You will ruin it for them, all right? So if you've heard this before, just sit in your silent brilliance. All right, here we go. A father and his son are driving. It's late at night, it's raining pretty hard. The roads are really slippery. Car starts to swerve back and forth, spins out of control, crashes into a tree. The father was killed instantly. EMT workers come to the scene, pick up the son, take him to the nearest hospital. They check him out in the emergency room. They're like, wow, he's pretty banged up. He needs surgery. They send him upstairs to the operating room. The surgeon walks into the operating room and says, I cannot operate on this boy. He's my son. How is that possible? Pause. How many of you have heard this before in any form? Okay, do not respond or whisper anything to your neighbor. For those who have not heard this before and just did not have something whispered to you, give me some possibilities. Just call them out. Stepfather, All right, stepfather right? Same sex dads. Mom, adopted father. What else? All right, father and son, but not related. Okay, we've also heard priests. Like some priests you call father, right? We've heard uh, sperm donor in the mix somehow. Okay. All right. All right. But for those who have heard this before, what is the traditional answer to this riddle? The surgeon is the boy's mother. Think about it. A father and his son are driving. Father gets killed. Boy, he takes to the hospital, up into surgery. The surgeon walks into the operating room and says, I cannot operate on this boy. He's my son. The surgeon is the boy's mother. Now, being completely honest, whether you heard this for the first time today, or think back to the very, very first time you heard this riddle. For how many of you all, the very first time you heard this riddle was your instant response, the surgeon is the mom? Okay, six or seven, that's about right. For many of us, including myself, we have some difficulty with it. Here's the deal, folks. Although intellectually, we realize that women can be surgeons, just like men, there still may be a little itty bitty part of you that equates surgeon with male. And that's implicit bias. That's where it lives. That's where it swims. That's where it functions, right? Unconscious associations between groups and traits that we don't even know we have. The reason you had difficulty with that riddle is because when you think surgeon, you think male. And you don't even know when it happened. Can you tell me the date? Exactly. And what I submit to you is there are thousands of other associations just like that one swimming around in your head below conscious awareness. You don't even know they exist. And you're still good people. Got to keep telling you that. Still good people, still good people, right? But you've been overexposed to certain groups and certain traits and certain groups in certain roles. All right, let's do it like this. Um, tell me who comes to mind, uh, male or female, and I know that gender is a continuum, but who comes to mind, male or female, when I say the following occupations, right? So I'll say the occupation, I go like this, you say out loud, who comes to mind, male or female? Okay, here we go. Who comes to mind when I say nurse, male or female? female. Secretary, male or female? female? Flight attendant, male or female? Now, you all know that men can do those jobs just like women, right? right. You all do know that, right?
Yes, it is. Okay? So by you saying female, that does not make you sexist. That, make you, that makes you human. You may have lived a life where you came across more female nurses and female secretaries and female nurses. And the recorder that's running in your mind throughout your lifetime is keeping track of those exposures in a cumulative fashion until your mind on its own gets to the point where it'll lock in that association for you and you will not even know when it happened. Folks, as we live life, we're going to be overexposed to certain groups of certain traits and certain groups of certain roles. Our minds are built to be efficient. Upon repeated exposure, it's going to lock those in. Uh, and usually that's a good thing. But every once in a while, it can go sideways. Let's do it like this. Besides Barack Obama, when I say President of the United States, what race comes to mind? White. What gender comes to mind? Yeah. Are you racist for saying white? No, that's the lob. Yeah, that's the easy one. No, you're not. I'm not racist. That's it. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, you're not. Are you sexist for saying male? No. With one exception, white male presidents is all you've ever known. Throughout the history of this country, the, all your history books, all your money and so forth, you've never seen a female president. We know that a woman can do the job, and this has not happened yet. So until it does, a woman is unlikely to come to mind. It doesn't make you a bad person, it makes you human. You could be a feminist to the 10th power, and I say president of the United States, and you still think white male. It doesn't make you less of a feminist, you just haven't seen a female president yet. Your mind can only lock in that to which has been exposed. If you haven't seen one, you just haven't seen one. Doesn't mean you're a bad person. Folks, let, let me be clear. Here are the two ingredients for having implicit bias. You ready? We'll make this plain. Here we go. Two ingredients for having implicit bias. Here we go. Living in society, having a brain. That's it. That's it. If that applies to you, you're going to have implicit unconscious bias. It's unavoidable, built into the machine. You can't get around it. Why? Because as we live in society, just by the very nature of living, we're going to be overexposed to certain groups and certain traits. Maybe more female nurses, maybe more male surgeons, maybe more female flight attendants. You're not a bad person, you're just living life. But as you're living life and you're being overexposed to groups and traits and groups and roles, your mind will lock it in because your mind is built to be efficient. So if I say surgeon, you think male, that doesn't make you a bad person. It makes you human. The susceptibility, the potential for having implicit bias comes with your humanity, with the body and the mind, not with your job or whatever your occupation may be. I train a lot of cops, and they'll say, oh, uh, well, you, you know, uh, you just think we're biased because we're police officers. No, I don't. I think we all have biases because we're human. And that applies to you. Even social workers on the front lines, yes, you too. Because you're human. Let me make this plain. Let me, uh, some of y'all still look a little flat face, right? All right, check it out. Say I'm a two-month-old infant baby. So I'm a two-month-old infant baby, and I'm living life, and it's great, and it's wonderful, and I'm having a good time, right? And every time a particular person enters the room, something good happens. I get a bottle, I get fed, I get love, something good happens, so this person walks in. Another person walks in, different face, and that good stuff does not happen. To which one of those faces do you think I'm going to respond more positively to going forward? The first or the second? The first, do you say to that two-month-old infant baby, you're discriminating, baby. You're a bad person, baby. You lack character, baby. <laughs> no, of course not. That's dumb, right? <laughs> Folks, even if we are hardwired, we are pre-wired to associate traits with individuals and traits with groups. Babies can discriminate. It's been shown. They're not even conscious beings yet. They don't even know they exist, but they can associate a trait with a face and a trait with a group. Oh, you better believe it. It's built into the machine. So stop sitting out there saying, oh, I don't have any biases. I treat everyone the same under every condition all the time. Please. No, you don't. That's ridiculous. <laughs> it is. If you ever love somebody, you've shown some bias. If you ever dislike somebody, you've shown some bias. Everybody in your life is not the same. Just be grown and accepted. As a human being, I have a brain, I have a mind. I'm going to be overexposed to certain groups, certain traits. My mind is built to be efficient. It's going to lock it in. Thus, the basis of bias, part of being human. Your, your question is not, do you have any biases? Spoiler alert, yes, you do, okay? Your work is following three questions. Here's, here's your work. You figure out which biases you have, what is the magnitude of them, and are they systematically advantaging or disadvantaging any particular group? That's the work. Not, do I have any? Are you human? Then yes, you have some. It, folks, it comes with the machine. Implicit bias is much more about the machinery of your mind than it is a content of your character. That was good. That was tweetable right there. That was good. Right? That was good. All right. All right. But I'm just saying, though, right? Because some people, you don't got to feel guilty and all of that. Just relax. All good. So we all have biases because we're human, but the impact of our biases and others does depend on the roles we play in society. Now, in society, there are special roles. Let's do it this way. Say you have two people. One is in your respective, you know, whether it's probation or child welfare, in your respective department, uh, and one is an accountant. Right, so, so say it's an accountant for children and family services, and then there's a social worker, and both of them have a strong or negative implicit bias or prejudice towards Cambodians. For which one of them do you think the experience of Cambodians with children and family services is more likely to be negatively affected, by the accountant or the social worker? 
social worker. The social worker doesn't have bias because he or she's a social worker. The, the uh, accountant has the same level of bias. But the social worker is in a role, is in a position, is in a situation where the expression of that bias is more likely to affect the target group. So yes, as a human being, you're going to have biases because you're human. But depending on the roles you play in society, the impact of your biases will vary. That's why I'm tough on forward-facing people. If you're a social worker, forward-facing, you're, you're, you're dealing with families, you're, you're, you're doing home visits, you're on the front lines, you must keep your biases in check. Also, if you are a leader, you're determining practice, policy, procedure, who gets hired, who gets promoted, assignment allocation, all those performance evaluation, all that stuff, you also must keep your biases in check. Why? Because you're just as human as everybody else, so you're going to have biases like everybody else. But the expression of them is the key. So here's your homework. What you do every day, here's what you do, okay? All right, got it. So take about a few seconds later today and think about the work you do every day and try to find moments of discretion. Moments where your subjective experience or your biases could influence how you complete a particular task or do a certain aspect of your job. And ask yourself, can I go about doing, a, doing this job in a particular way that cuts the link between biased thinking and an outcome? Example, I did a training in uh, Philadelphia a couple years ago, uh, some of the mayor's staff, my brother's keeper, and, and some uh, police officers. So a Philly PD officer, he says, Dr. Marks, you're right. I know I have biases. It's changed the way I go about policing. I said, really, what do you do? He says, well, um, but say I have a, a, a tra traffic infraction, like a speeding ticket, and somebody's going 10 to 15 miles over the limit. Say it's a 50 mile, mile an hour zone, and they're going 10 to 15 miles over. For those who have talked your way out of tickets before, <laughs> as you know, officers can give a ticket or a warning, right? He says to me, I know I can give a ticket or a warning, so I decide whether it's going to be a ticket or a warning before I get out of my vehicle. I said, why do you do that? He says, well, I know I have biases. So now I get out of my vehicle, I walk over, I'm seeing the driver, I'm seeing race, I'm seeing gender, I'm seeing age, I'm seeing attractiveness, I'm hearing an accent, all these bases of bias are swimming in my head now. So if I'm on the fence, ticket or a warning, my biases can kick in. If I decide before I get out of my vehicle, it's clean. Do you all see the elegance of that? Folks, here's what you do, homework. Ask a police officer, when you have a traffic stop, how do you decide whether it's a ticket or a warning? And listen to what they say. Most of them will say, I decide in a moment. And we get a lot of back talking attitude, ticket for you. If you're remorseful and kind, warning for you. Literally, most cops decide in the moment, unless they got some kind of quota system or whatever, right? Folks, he said, I know I have biases. I'm gonna make the decision before I get out of my vehicle. Clean, okay? That's your task. Can you go about doing your job every day in a way that whatever biases you have will not affect an outcome? Because you're doing your job in such a way that cuts the link between biased thinking and what you do. That's the work, okay? So. Um, so, uh, our definition of implicit bias, formal definition, it refers to stereotypes that affect our attitudes, understanding, actions, and decisions in an unconscious manner. These biases, which encompass both favorable and unfavorable assessments, are activated involuntarily and without an individual's awareness or intentional control. This is LA County's working definition adapted from the Kerwin Institute at Ohio State University. So there are two or three major definitions of implicit bias. Uh, the folks at Kerwin at, at Ohio State doing some really good work, so I'm good with this uh, definition. Most of the definitions have certain elements in common. Uh, it starts with stereotypes, groups and traits. It starts with, always starts with stereotypes, the grouping and trait, the cognition. It can lead to disliking, it can lead to behavior, but it can also start and stop at the thinking level, okay? So implicit bias can happen at the thinking, uh, that is stereotypes, the feeling, prejudice, or the discrimination behavior levels, okay? So this is sort of our working definition. What do we know over the past 30, 40 years of research on implicit bias? We all have biases, but the impact of our biases on others depends on the roles we play in society. We talked about that already. Implicit bias is more prevalent than explicit or conscious bias because our minds are cognitive mach thinking machines that encode, take in, and store many associations between groups and traits that we have not consciously processed. We have all types of biases. Question, how many of you all have a favorite number? Favorite number, anybody have a favorite number? Okay, all right. Who in here that has a favorite number, who in here could prove scientifically and objectively that your favorite number is superior to the other numbers? Uh, you can prove it, uh, okay, all right. But the notion is we have favorites, right? Numbers don't even exist. The abstract concepts we created to quantify the world. But we have favorites, right? All right. So yes, we have biases as numbers, so shapes, so colors. In the US, whether you know this or not, when you see another human being, there's a part of you at a subconscious level that tries to categorize other people according to race, gender, and age, automatically whenever you see another human being. It just happens. Why? Because in the US, those categories have meaning. Your mind is built to be efficient. Thinking in categories is actually quite efficient. If you ask me where I'm from, and I tell you where originally, I'm from New York City. You say, okay, New York City, 
So he's probably ridden a subway, he's probably seen snow, and he's probably been in New York City traffic. So you may not necessarily ask me that. It comes with the package, right? So if, I, if, if you tell me that you're a probation officer, I'll say, okay, probation officer, okay. So um, he's probably, you know, a juvenile, in a juvenile facility. So he's probably been around kids. He's probably has to follow state California compliance rules, right? So certain things are just going to come with the occupation. So once I know your category, other information is activated. That's pretty efficient. I don't have to ask you a series of questions about the other information. Same thing with race in the U.S. When you, know whether somebody, when you know somebody's black, white, Hispanic, Asian, there may be certain traits or if, uh, pieces of information you associate with those categories, right? Race matters in the U.S. Race does not matter the same way around the world. For those who have traveled, if you've been in countries where people look more alike, certain African countries, certain Asian countries, I mean, certain European countries, Russia and other places, people look more similar. You don't have the, the variation we have here. Race is irrelevant, okay? You have uh, religion. Nation or tribe, class, caste, these other things begin to matter. Okay, all right, gotcha. All right, so what else do we know? Implicit bias is a stronger predictor of day-to-day -day behavior than explicit or conscious bias because much of our behavior and thoughts are automatic. The potential impact of implicit bias on behavior can be overridden by conscious effort. So just because you take the IAT or some other measure of implicit bias, you find out you have certain biases, that does not lock you into mistreating a group or disliking a group. You can engage in conscious processes to cut the link between bias thinking and an outcome, as I mentioned earlier with the police example. In, term of com in terms of common biases and targets in the United States, here's what we know. Most biases arise from external characteristics, such as race or gender. So we have the isms there. Arabs and Muslims are a common target of bias in the US, particularly since 9-11. People who are overweight, common target of bias. LGBTQ communities, common target of bias. Undocumented individuals, common target of bias. But America's strongest negative bias is actually toward the elderly, followed by the obese, okay? It's pretty interesting, that seems counterintuitive. But the elderly uh, on the receiving end, the most negative bias in the US, okay? At, a, at an implicit level, okay? All right, so I'm running a little short on time. I wanna make sure I do this. Oh, let me do this one right here, okay. All right, so everybody looking at the screen, I'm gonna flash an image. I want you to tell me what you saw. Everybody looking, everybody looking. It's gonna be real quick, real quick. Here we go, real quick, here we go, real quick, here we go. What'd you see? You see anyone who looked like a celebrity? Who? John Lennon? All right, we've also heard Hillary Clinton. All right, but how, how many faces or people did you see in the image? Some say one, some say two. All right, look again. How many people do you see? Keep looking. How many people do you see? Keep on looking. Keep on looking. All right, so how many people do you see? All right, some saying three, some saying four, and some not saying at all. Here we go. So we have the overall face. We can say that's John Lennon. We've got the little magic banner down there. A figure in white, that's the head, that's the hand. A figure in red, that's the head, these are the hands. And a little boy playing the guitar right in the middle. See that now? All right, when I flashed it, your occipital lobe, the part of your brain responsible for vision, did see it. You sensed it, you did not perceive it. That's the distinction between implicit and explicit, right? The information was there. Your implicit level tried to process it, but you did not have enough time at the conscious level to figure all these things out. That's how this plays out in human relations as well. All right, so a couple of quick pieces on what implicit bias looks like in the real world, then I gotta wrap up, okay? Uh, taller employees have been shown to receive higher wages than their shorter counterparts. And more, <laughs> and more attractive employees have been shown to receive higher starting salaries than their less attractive counterparts, right? So if you're short, you better look good. All right, let's keep it tight. Go to the gym, work it out. You know, you can be short and good looking. You can balance out. Okay, okay. what else? Here we go. <laughs> Qualifications being equal, that is credit score, financial history, income, et cetera. Blacks and Hispanics were less likely to be approved for home mortgages and paid higher interest rates on loans when they were approved. Next, education, previous performance being equal. Can he go on through 12th grade teachers have shown low expectations and displayed less social comfort with African-American students and some so groups of Latinos than white students. Various researchers have found that over the past 40, 50 years. Next, people who show implicit bias towards Latinos are more likely to oppose both illegal and legal immigration, okay? Next. Symptoms being equal, African Americans and some subgroups of Latinos are less likely to receive the most effective treatment for illnesses, even after matching them on income and insurance coverage. Folks, racial disparities in healthcare, rampant. Rampant. When you get it some time, look at infant mortality rates by race in the US, and then look at the state of California. Stunning. It's almost like we're in a developing country. No shade in developing countries, but as advanced as we're supposed to be, that data should not exist in the way it does, okay? All right. 
Next, check this out. This is deep right here. Regular weight job applicants were less likely to be recommended to be hired for a job when they were seen in a photo sitting next to an obese applicant than when they were seen sitting alone or next to a regular weight person. That's called bias or stigma by association. The person sitting next to you can affect how you're evaluated. And you don't even know what's happening. Okay. Next, what do we know? Um, we're taking numerous factors into account. For example, the seriousness of the primary offense, the number of prior offenses, et cetera. Black males are the most prominent Afrocentric features. That is to say, dark skin, a wide nose, full lips. We're most likely to receive longer sentences from judges, receive death penalty convictions from juries when the victim was white, not when the victim was black, and be mistaken for a suspect by police. Folks are talking about thicker lips, a wider nose, and darker skin. Death row, extended sentence. Right? And I'm not saying it's a grand conspiracy. These would be good, well-meaning people not even know their biases are showing. But this is how implicit bias can show up. Because folks, the way you got to process this is, if it's not implicit, then it's what? Explicit. Imagine if this was explicit. You're implicit, that's your best case scenario. Explicit, we got a whole new set of problems, okay? All right, what else do we know? Child welfare services, in terms of how uh, that can be affected by implicit bias. Safety of children, so implicit bias can affect a caseworker's perception of what is or is not child abuse and whether they believe a parent, that can lead to potential removal of a child. You can have cultural differences in what you perceive as discipline. Right? Oh, they're yelling at them, that's verbal abuse. Well, is it the tone, is it the words, is it the phrasing? Coming from your background, you see somebody else from a different background, you may have a different lens through which you view or interpret what abuse is. Right? Some things are obvious, some things are in the gray area, but your biases can play a role, trust. Next, permanency. Implicit bias can affect the perceptions of a family's strengths or deficits and who should attend the family or team conferences depending on what the situation is. So you may see if the, if the, the, the biological mother and father are not in the household, they have an extended situation, you may see that as dysfunctional based upon your background, based on how you see culture. If, you, if there's a village approach to raising a child, the child is still functional and supported, but it may not look like what you're used to it looking like. That doesn't mean the child is at a disadvantage. Be very careful, okay? Next. Adoption and foster care. <clears throat> Implicit bias can affect a social worker's perception of a stable home. How do you define stable? If I asked, if I polled everybody in here, would you give me the same definition of stable? Would a criteria match across the board, right? What's your definition of what stable is? What is safe, a safe home? An appropriate childcare arrangement if the parent works. You are human, you're gonna have biases. Even within your department, you all may not have the same definition of stable, safe, and appropriate, right? That's what we're talking about, folks. All right, so now let's talk about probation real quick and then I got to wrap, okay? Youth of color have been shown, that is Latinos and blacks for the most part, are overrepresented at every stage of the juvenile justice system, every stage. So if you're working at a camp or some facility, keep this in mind. Next, youth of color are treated more harshly than white, white youth in similar circumstances. They've done this experimentally and in the field. Next, disparities are greater at the front end of the criminal justice system, that is who suspected, arrested, and charged. So you may, not even, you may not even see certain populations on your camps and so forth because they don't even make it through the system because there's bias on the front end, on the criminal justice side. Next, disparities can accumulate in the system, whether it's plea options, sentencing, probation terms, et cetera. Youth of color are about one-third of the adolescent population with two-thirds of incarcerated youth, okay? Folks, this, I'm not saying this is all a grand conspiracy. This is blatant racism. I would say there's a fair and healthy amount of implicit biases all in the mix here, okay? So you work in systems. And if biases are prevalent throughout your systems, it can have these cumulative effects. Folks, please accept and understand the notion of cumulative advantage or cumulative disadvantage. If I'm more likely to be suspected, right, I'm pulled over, I'm more likely to be searched, I'm more likely to be handcuffed, I'm more likely to be brought in every single stage criminal justice, and then when it gets to you, there's a little bit of bias, a little bit of bias, a little bit of bias. So we start, the gap can start here, but as they go through your systems, it goes like this, and like this, and like this, and like this. So once they get through, there's huge gaps. Okay, even though you only contributed a minor fraction. Incremental bias accumulates over time. Okay, all right, so, got to go, so they're going to give me the hook. Okay, all right, so, um, so this afternoon, we'll talk about, why, why, I mean, this next session, I keep saying this afternoon, next session, why does implicit bias exist, how is it measured, um, how does it affect the person holding the bias, um, how does it affect the target, and then how can it be reduced or managed. Um, uh, can, I, can, I, can I do a motivational moment for two minutes? Can I do two minutes? Can I, can I motivate y'all for two minutes? Everybody's not going to be in my second session. I need to do this for y'all, especially I got the state here. I'm going to use the bully pulpit. Check it out. Here's a question. Are you a thermometer or a thermostat? Thermometer? Thermostat. What is a thermometer? Thermometer is a thermometer. Thermo means heat, meter means measure of. So thermo, a thermometer is a measure of heat. It reflects the environment. The mercury inside the thermometer will rise and fall with the heat of the day. The thermometer is a follower, okay? The thermostat is different. The thermostat is an influencer. So you walk into the room and it's too warm, what do we do? We adjust huh, the thermostat and the room adjusts to it. Here's a question. 
what matter of man or woman are you? Thermometer, a thermostat. <laughs> the thermometer person enters the workplace, especially children and family services, enters the workplace. People taking two hour lunches, you start taking them too. People on the internet three hours a day, you on it too, right? People not returning phone calls, answering their phone when it rings, you don't answer it either. People taking home office supplies, you start taking them home too, right? <laughs> Yeah, I got y'all with that one. I got you. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, well, folks, I'm telling you, the thermometer is a follower. The thermostat is different. When the thermostat walks into the room, the room changes, right? Folks, I was in California, L.A. about 20 years ago with some frat brothers sort of hanging out uh, in one of their houses to sort of eat and drink and have a good time. And one of my boys enters the room, uh, enters the house, and he sees that it's just the fellas. It's just the guys in the room. He says, oh, okay, where the hoes at? Where the hoes at? Asking where the hoes are, asking really where the women are, referring to them as hoes. Then he sees me. He says, oh, okay, I'm sorry, Brian's here. Where are the queens and the princesses at? <laughs> right? Because he knows I do not call women out of their name. I don't curse. I don't say the N-word. I have not for over 20 years. I don't judge people who do, but my very presence in that moment changed his language. That was a thermostat moment. Here's the question. What impact do you have when you walk in the room? <laughs> if you're a thermometer, you walk in the room, it's like, oh, it's on now. Two hour lunches. Let's go home early. Don't fill out that form. Whatever the case is, shortcuts. When a thermostat walks into the room, the very thought of you changes the level of work ethic and excellence in the room. Oh no, answer your phone, do your job, fill out the report. He doesn't play, she doesn't play. When they just think of you, they think excellence. That's a thermostat influence, right? But let me speak to my thermostats in the room. As a thermostat, let me speak prophetically over your life right now. If you are a thermostat, here's what's gonna happen if it hasn't happened already. You're going to experience moments of loneliness. Why? You could be a thermostat surrounded by a bunch of thermometers. I just said something there. Huh. And when you are a thermostat surrounded by a bunch of thermometers, here's what's likely to happen. When you're in a critical mass of thermometers, some thermometers, critical mass, can become so functional in their dysfunction that it seems normal. Y'all missed that. That was good, right? Sometimes the dysfunction becomes the norm, and you're going to feel strange for doing the right thing and functioning with excellence because that's who you are. They're going to say, ooh, why are you working so hard? You say, because I'm a thermostat, and that's what I do. <laughs> right? But if you're surrounded by a bunch of thermometers, they're not going to get you, especially if you're a visionary. They can't see what you see. All right, but to the thermostats in the room, right? So if you're a thermometer, and I know, I know I'm supposed to be thermostats here, but I'm going to give you a message to give to your people. If you're a thermometer, if you are burnt out, if you are jaded, if you hate your job, hate them students, hate them family, hate them kids, you're just hanging on to get your benefits, I'm just trying to get my package, trying to retire and get my package. They're just hanging on to get my package. If that's the case for you, here's my advice. Quit. Bounce. Leave. Do something else. Yeah, I said it. Because many of your coworkers want to say it to you, but they can't. So I'm saying it for them. Folks, for everything, there is a season. And for some of y'all, your season is up. Just be grown. Folks, lives are on the line. Don't come to work every day just jaded, burnt out, trying to get your check. There's somebody's life on the other end of your jadedness. You would do more damage as a burnt out, jaded, keep my job person than somebody five or 10 years younger than you who can take your job. You say, ooh, they can't replace me. Yes, they can. Trust, right? Now, let me be clear, y'all. I am not an angry black man, okay? <laughs> I'm a little intense, I'm a little passionate, but y'all, this is the Children, Family Services and Probation, y'all gotta get this at a deep level. All right, so I'm gonna pause here. I'm already over time. Here's my contact information, social media stuff. Thank you for your time and attention. Have a great day. <laughs>